Amen. Bless you. All right. I know the feeling. Uh, it is good to be here. It is good to be with each of you. Today we're going to be talking about keys to victory in Jesus. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Luke 14, we'll be looking at verses 25 through 35. Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own uh, father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So here, Jesus is talking to us about discipleship. Jesus is uh, talking to us about what it's going to take to be his follower. Jesus is talking about the price we're going to have to pay. So here, Jesus is turning to address the crowds that are traveling with him. And he lists allegiance to one's family and the shackles of one's possessions as impediments to authentic discipleship. And so if uh, our first question that we have today is there, what are two negative conditions of discipleship? What are some things that uh, aren't positive about being a disciple. Now, what he's told us in this previous section as we looked at it, that we have to hate those that we love. We have to hate ourselves. And what does it mean to hate? Here, as, as he's talking about it, he is talking about a person ha having to commit himself or herself to Christ and to, to develop that greater love, you have to give up or have a greater love for Jesus than you do your family. You see, loving and following Christ may be seen as renunciation or rejection of your family. And as I look at that, that is a negative cost of discipleship because I don't know about you, but I love my family. I love my son. I love my wife. I love my parents. I love my sister. I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I see as uh, Lois is sitting there next to her grandchild, I know that she loves that grandchild. Glad you're here with us today, by the way. Man, loving giving up things that you love it's just a tough it's a tough thing and what does jesus mean by that i think what he's telling us is, is that you have to develop an intensity for what you believe you see you have to have an eagerness and an ardent interest in the pursuit of following jesus pushing the world aside and making following Jesus the most important item on your daily agenda. He's, he's telling us we have to get rid of the uh, things that obscure our, our look to God. You see, he's telling us to develop an emotion that forces us to speak or act or go places we would not normally go. Jesus doesn't necessarily want us to go to the comfortable, to the place that we are conditioned to be, to be in all those spaces with our homogenous group. He doesn't necessarily believe that our psychosocial uh, group of uh, 
like income peers is where we always have to be. Now, notice also one of the things that he is telling us is that you have to carry your own cross. Man, tell you what, I want someone else to carry my cross. Number one, I don't want to have a cross. Number two, I don't want to, I don't want to have to carry it. But as he's talking about that, he's talking about carrying burdens. You have to be willing to carry your own burdens in life. What does that mean? You have to accept life's pressure. And what is life's pressure? Man, we have media that is bombarding us all the time. If we have our telephones on, our TVs on, I don't think we really listen to the radio that much, maybe in our cars, except I have... Uh, my Apple app, so I don't actually do that either. But everything is saying there are presidential elections that are pressing in on us. There's a homeless crisis in our neighborhood that is pressing in on us. Man, if you had told me 25 years ago that we would have signs around our building that, that actually say no camping here. I wouldn't have believed you. So accept life's pressure. Pressure is coming in on us. God expects us to, to understand the pressures are coming in on us. He also asks us to accept life's experience. Part of carrying that cross is understanding who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. God wants you to know what your direction in life is, where you're going to take yourself, or maybe even better, where you're going to let Jesus take you. He wants us also to know that life's presence is lost when you carry a cross because your life has been given over to higher authorities. If you are carrying the cross, you have died to self, and you are saying, I am willing to let Jesus rule my life. Also, life's promises from the world are ending as you carry the cross, because God's promises are beginning. So what are we talking about here? What are we actually trying to uh, nail down today? Well, what we're trying to say here is that Jesus is talking about authentic belief. And when we say authentic belief, real or genuine, not copied or false, true and accurate. Something that, that says we are going to face life with transparency and we are going to be real. See, Jesus does not want us to live behind a veil a veil that hides our perceived faults that are hidden from others to allow us to look better than them. He wants us to be authentic. He wants us to be who we are. He doesn't want us to fake it. See, what Jesus is doing is calling for the reconstruction of your identity. Man, I wish Gary Patton was here today. That man likes talks about identity. And you know what? He has had a transformed identity in the last 20 years. If you only, but, but here as we talk about restructuring your, or reconstructing your, your, your identity, reconstruction is not to be along ancestral lines or on the basis of one's social status, but within the new community oriented towards God's purpose and characterized by faithfulness to the message of Jesus. Our identities have to reflect whose we are. When we went down into the water and grave baptism, we said we are no longer going to be me, we are going to follow Jesus. 
then we are going to honor that with a life that says so. So how can you reconstruct your identity? Got your pen and paper? Man, I'm going to give you four easy things that you can remember. All right, I see that Colleen Patton has got hers out. All right, so first of all, number one, value Jesus more than yourself. You see, I can't put me first. I can't have pride about all the things that I accomplished, and I cannot put myself on a pedestal that is greater than Jesus. Number two, I have to value Jesus more than my family. Now, this it's easy for me to self-deprecate and start pushing me down, although I, don't, I, I love Precious. Don't, don't, don't think that I don't. But value Jesus more than your family. This is where it starts getting tough. Because, you know, if you start messing with Krista or you start messing with Matthew, those are fighting words. You know, uh, I value my family, but what Jesus is wanting us to value him more than them. Number three, value Jesus more than your friends. It's, it's easy to have our cliques uh, that affirm us, that, that actually tell us how great we are and are showing us uh, how we are on the right road, whether we're on the right road or not. What Jesus is saying to us is, I mean more to you than your friends do. Number four, value Jesus more than your job. Folks, I like to work. I, but I also have a great job, by the way, and I have worked for a great person for the last 24 years, and the people that have supported me the last 24 years are wonderful people too, by the way, and that is, of course, you. But value Jesus more than your job. You have to put Jesus before the job. It's easy to, to get into the position of where we actually say, I can't be there uh, this Sunday because you know, I've got to make a living. Folks, you don't have a life without Christ. Now, I, I'm going to say you're excused, okay? You, you, I'm going to give you a pass on, on this one, but this is what I believe Jesus is expecting. But what do we also know about Jesus? He's full of grace, okay? We are not going to be perfect, are we? But, so, reconstruct your identity. Start valuing Jesus more than anything else in this world. So what are the keys to victory in Jesus? How can we actually achieve the victory that we want? Man, how can we sing that song, Victory in Jesus? Verses 28 through 30 read like this. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish it. Verse 31, or what king... When he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else, while other, the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So as we are looking for keys to victory in Jesus... The first thing you have to do here 
Okay, first of all, we are going to value Jesus, right? That's getting our identity in order. But now we're looking for keys to success in the kingdom. The first way is survey your situation. What are the things that I am battling in my life that are taking me away from life in Christ? What is it that I am placing ahead of relational issues with Christ so that I can be uh, part of them instead of part of him? See, when the resources are in the right place and available, the battle can be won. So as we bring that home to us, we have to make sure that our life resources are in order. We can't win the battle if we're not reading scripture. We can't win the battle if we are not involved in studying the Bible. You can't just read it, you have to study it, but then also we have to be talking to God. We have to be praying. We have to be involved. We have to be developing that relationship. Now, what we know is when resources are not in place and not available, things go awry. And so if you have the, if you are the one who has 10,000 soldiers and 20,000 soldiers are coming your way and you are not ready, you have to try to know who has the resources available. You see, what we have to realize is that there's a plan in place for us when we have problems. Knowing the resources, having the resources available, being ready to take on the resources, not take on the resources, but take on the world as the world comes your way. Survey your situation. But next, finish what you start. See, it's important to finish what you start. Notice in the text, if you go to build the tower and you put all your resources in it, but then you're unable to build the tower, then you are ridiculed by the community. Apply that spiritually. You say you're a Christian, and you start building your Christian life, but you don't use the resources available, and you fall away. Does the community around you ridicule you? So follow through is a key here to victory. Know that those who do not follow through on what they start will be ridiculed according to verses 29 and 30. And when I say ridiculed, first of all, know this, when you become a Christian, you get ridiculed. But even, even more, when you actually fall away, you're ridiculed. Now, you're in good company if you are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Jesus tells us that. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. The great philosopher, King Rogers, said this. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and know when to run. You see, as a Christian, you really can't fake it until you make it. You have to be authentic. You have to be believable. You have to be real. You have to have your resources in order, and you have to be ready for the world to come at you. Verse 33 says this, So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. question for everybody here who likes their possessions 
okay. Me and I, well, I've, I've said it from here many times, I like my toys. I like my Class A motor home. I like, uh, man, there's not many things in this world that I, I like. I like my big screen TV. I like my iPhone. My iPhone really gets a lot of attention. My iPhone tells me that I spent six hours uh, per day on it every day last week, which is way too much. Now, isn't that something? Your, your phone keeps track of your time and lets you know how much you're using it. Man. You know that Spotify also keeps track of how many minutes you're on it throughout the year. And my son, I think, I can't even remember how many thousands of minutes he's been on Spotify last year. None of you can be my disciples who does not give up all his own possessions. He's not telling us we can't have possessions, but the priority uh, of we actually, that we actually put into those possessions. You have to be careful because we're trying to follow after Jesus. So what is Jesus telling us? First of all, Surrender what you are holding on to. Put aside all competing protections in order that you might refashion your life and identity according to the standards of the kingdom of God. Boy, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Get rid of the stuff that's in your way in your relationship with Jesus. Whatever it is. Is it golf? Is it baseball? Is it uh, motor, home, RVing, full-time stuff? Uh, is it crafting? Ooh. You name it. What, what is it that you really want to put all your effort into that keeps you from doing what God wants you to? What Jesus is telling us in this scripture is to surrender what you're holding on to. Now what that means... Give it all up for God. What are you willing to give up for God? What are you willing to give up for the one who is willing to die on the cross for your sins? What are you willing to do for the one who is, is working for your salvation? The one who is looking to make sure that you are the whole person that you are. What are you willing to give up for the love of God? Jesus, of course, is telling us here in verse 33 that ownership of possessions gets in our way of a relationship with God. The warning he's given us is that possessions must not distract us from God's work. Possessions must not pry us away from our time with God. And possessions create pride that hurts our relationships with others in God. He's also telling us our personal resources are insufficient for God's work. You see, if keeping this church running is left up to all my resources, it ain't going to happen. If, if getting the message out to everyone in the world is left up to my resources. It's not going to happen. God is saying that we have to recognize that he is powerful. He is the one in control and he's the one that really matters. As he said earlier, we have to give up everything to follow Jesus. He's saying we must give up family we have to give up our assets. And I know this is a harsh uh, mission. It's, it's tough on me. We are useless to God when we are attached to the world. 
if we are attached to our things, then we can't do what God needs us to do. God needs us to be able to take his message to a lost world. As I look at this next point, I'm just, uh, my, my profoundness just astounds me at times. I am a legend in my own mind, remember? Okay, what we own does not define who we are. Okay? You want to know what defines who we are or who does? Jesus does. Our relationship with Jesus is the definition of who we are and what we need to be for the world. If you want to know what your identity should be and what you should look like, you look at the cross. You look at the cross and see what he was willing to do for all of mankind. He was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to hurt. He was willing to go where no man can go. Verse 34, therefore, salt is good, but even salt has, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I always hate it when one of the scriptures ends with that. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Because sometimes I am looking at that scripture and I am dumbfounded. Sometimes I'm not hearing. I'm not seeing. But I think I got this one. So what's he telling us here about salt? He's telling us, first of all, salt does three things. Salt preserves. It keeps organics from decaying and decomposing. Salt is something that, that stops that decomp process. He also tells us here that salt enhances. It makes food more flavorful. It brings flavors up to the surface. Man, try, uh, try V8 juice in the low sodium, uh, and then try V8 juice with sodium. You're going to know that it is, has an enhanced flavor there. But then also salt stabilizes. It is a mineral that keeps the body working. All you have to do is dehydrate a little bit and watch the cramps start coming to your body. Salt does important things. What we know is the Spirit of God is like salt. He's telling us here the Spirit of God is like salt. It permeates people. Salt is within us. It enhances them. The salt being the spirit of God is going to make you a better person for the world. But not only that, it preserves people. That's what eternal life is all about, is the preservation of the soul. So that we will be creatures uh, of the already but not yet. So that we will actually go on to be with God on high. So it permeates, it enhances, it preserves, and it stabilizes. God wants us stable here. So salt is good. The salt here represents the spirit of God within us. Our walk with Christ should be evident. We must be impacting the environment around us. If, if salt is the spirit of God and it is within us, people are going to know that we are Jesus' people. We should change the environment around us. You know, earlier I mentioned the fact that we have no camping signs around the building. But those things develop over a period of time, we actually spent five years 
inviting, inviting, inviting people who don't have homes to come here on Thursdays. And guess what? They came. Now, that's just showing you that sometimes things can go a little bit overboard, but here, being salt, we have to, we have to do what it's about, we're about. We have to uh, do what God wants us to do. So, we have to be about bringing light to make the world better. Salt is going to make the world better. Now, notice in this text, it talks about salt losing its savor. He says it becomes useless. What does that mean? No longer good in the kitchen. It's, it, it doesn't enhance flavor anymore. And what we're talking about is calcium chloride as opposed to sodium chloride. Uh, calcium chloride is the salt of uh, the Middle East at this time. And calcium chloride actually breaks down over time. If it gets moisture in it, it makes a different um, mineral altogether. So it's no longer flavorful. But then it continues to break down so much that it's not even a good herbicide. You can toss it out into the manure pile and it has no effect on doing anything. It is now completely useless. It's not going to actually do any of the things that we've mentioned previously. How about us? What does it look like when we lose our savor in Christ? Well, first of all, we fade away from God. It's a slow process. Uh, the, the fact that some of us actually, over time, uh, our relationship, our enthusiasm, things start to lessen and slow down. But then also, uh, as the fade grows worse, we walk away from God. We start missing times with each other. We start missing opportunities to share the word of God with someone. We start not keeping our ethics and morals to the standard we're supposed to. But then phase three in your loss of savor is this, you run away from God. It no longer matters to you uh, what God thinks, what Christians think, what other people think, because it's all about you from then on. Once you have lost your savor, that is the spirit of God. And as you're doing this, you no longer live up to the standards of God, therefore you become useless to God. And at that point, you're only good to go to the garbage dump of life if you lose your saltiness. And so today, what about your saltiness? Think about it. Review within you. What about your saltiness? The first question is going to be, have you committed to Christ and received your salt? Has the Spirit of God uh, come upon you? Has, have you? Have you repented and been baptized and received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Have you committed to Christ and received your salt? Have you changed? Have you changed the way you were living? Have you been immersed? Have you died to self and come up out of the watery grave of baptism, a new person? Have you received the salt? Have you received the, the, the Holy Spirit as a gift uh, from God? And you, have you received the gift of eternal life with Christ? Contemplate that for a moment. Next. Last question. Have you received your salt and feel like you're losing it? 
Do you feel like your salt, uh, the salt that you once had, the saltiness of God that you once had is less today than it was yesterday? Is it just a little less? Is it a lot less? Or is it uh, a lot, lot, lot less? Think about it. God compels you and me to be committed to him. God asks us to lay down our lives, pick up our cross, and follow him. And so today, Russ is going to lead us in a song, and during that song, if you have anything that you need to work on and pray about or share with the congregation, come as we stand and as we sing. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever trust and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Please be seated. Seven hundred and 